Those are the charges. Right. But as well as character. Right. But, yeah. How about his honesty? Did that play into the yeah. picture much at all? That's factual or just evidence? We talked about it a lot, but there weren't too many uh, negative aspects of the honesty question that we could come up with. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, no, no. Sir, we've got Mr. Question. Bannister's videotape running and a camera Oscar, and a, and a, here, and a uh, yeah. audio tape running. And I know you've already answered a lot of questions earlier, but for the benefit of Joe's personal tape for his family later, would you um, just say a comment about uh, just ad lib and go wherever direction you want about uh, some of the things we've talked about already? Uh, Joe and uh, the charges and what was relevant to you guys, what wasn't relevant, uh, just some of the things we've talked about already that uh, just repeat them for the benefit of the videotape. What was relevant on the conspiracy charge was that it was obvious to us that Mr. Bannister had spent a lot of time investigating uh, this subject and that he firmly believed in uh, the subject matter that was what we had to consider in the trial. We shouldn't condemn a man for what he believes in. And uh, we didn't find anything dishonest or deceitful in any of the other charges that were brought before us in this trial. I think he I'm, was innocent. John, does that mic look like it's on? Or is yeah, it on switch? I, I turned it off. I think I'd be redundant to go ahead and, and just repeat what uh, uh, Bruce has just said. But uh, the whole focus with me was whether indeed you believed in what you were doing. And from the very, very beginning, as I listened to the judge's instructions and instructed uh, the idea of, of whether there was a belief, and I said to myself, well, if a person really believes in something, should he or she be thrown in, into jail? And I, I just don't agree with that kind of thing, and I, I don't think we do that in our country. And uh, with that kind of thing, I think the whole focus was on your credibility, your belief in what you're doing. Had you not believed in what you were doing, it would have been different. Oscar, thank you. I'll say a comment if you would like to, uh, and Bruce afterwards if you'd like, about uh, what you talked about earlier concerning the fact that uh, um, uh, well, you just talked about the uh, belief and willfulness, but what about the fact that uh, the government, um, they didn't have any evidence, and uh, shoot, yeah. was rolling, I forgot my name. Well, frankly, there, there, was, there was no evidence given. I, I, I looked at the case and I thought that, I asked myself, what, what the hell's going on here? There's no case. Right. Oh, I know what I was going to ask you guys to comment on, the fact that when you had the second opportunity, the first day of the trial, you watched the videotape, the two-hour SenCal videotape, and then more recently, more, rec more recently after, uh, after when you were going to deliberation, the SenCal tape, you requested to see it again. Tell us again why that second viewing, you know, what was significant about that to you fellas? Why did you want it? Because we hadn't really seen the whole picture before viewing the videotape the first time. And after seeing all the evidence and going through the rest of the trial, we wanted to see it again. <clears throat> Bottom line is it would only have been fair to Mr. Bannister to look at what he'd said before in the proper context. And as far as evidence, uh, I think the government's evidence actually worked against them. <laughs> yeah. Could you elaborate on that, please? Well, it just showed Mr. Bannister to be honest and straightforward and working within the law to the best of my uh, estimation of what we looked at. Viewing that second tape for me just really reaffirmed what I saw in the first, the first viewing. Uh, I think I was able to uh, tie in the, the judge's uh, instructions onto the, what I heard in the tape, what I saw Mr. Bannister doing, and for me it was just kind of re reaffirmation that, the, that we were talking about a, a case here that was dealing with conspiracy, but I was not seeing that. It, it just it was not going to happen, and I saw that the man was believed he, was, he, is a, he has a cause, and he's, he's pursuing that cause. Uh, sometimes we do pay penalties for causes, but in, th in this case, I think that uh, he's a bird in the saddle.
Thank you. If you still have a, a minute, could you repeat uh, something you said earlier before the video was rolling about uh, what it meant to you uh, in terms of free speech, what you saw Joe seemed to be you know, speaking, answering, qu asking questions, the questions weren't answered. Here, you know, why are we here for, you know, along those lines, the speaking versus these crimes? You, had, right. ma you had made some comments along those lines. <clears throat> Uh, we didn't see any reason to penalize Mr. Bannister for speaking freely about any subject he wants to speak about, period. I second that. I certainly, I certainly hope I don't ever lose my right to speak. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> With people like you doing what you did, you won't. Right. Absolutely. That's yes. why you guys are, right. we just need so much to because right. people know the right thing to do. And they, they don't, don't do, do it. And you guys did. Well, a lot of us have a lot to lose because we're, we're not heroes. We just didn't see the evidence, evidence just was not there to, to bring a conviction. It was, the state did not have evidence, didn't have a case. We went to great effort to follow the judge's instructions explicitly and read them over and over and over again to make sure we were doing the right thing. I can tell you that the defense was prepared to allow Mr. Bannister to testify on his own, on his own, for on his own behalf. They also had some witnesses they were prepared to unleash, uh, but some things happened that I won't go into now that caused them to uh, choose not to expose Mr. Bannister to cross-examination. Did the jury that you know of have any kind of uh, wonderings as to why wasn't this man, who apparently likes to go around the country talking about his views, wasn't going to talk to you in person? Was that a problem for you guys? I believe my, at least my general impression was that the government uh, presented enough evidence in favor of Mr. Banner as Mr. <laughs> must be what the, <laughs> seriously, that was the only conclusion you could come yeah. to because where was the defense witnesses? Right. Yeah. No need. Why did that tape get in there? Why did the prosecution bring that in, in, that, in that tape? You know, it really, it, know? It, it really, it was really strong for the for, for your side. Do you why really know? Do you know why the tape got in there? That's exactly. from, from what I know, okay, there's Joe would obviously have a better grip on this than me, but my understanding is that that tape, which is several years old now, uh, when when Mr. Thompson was visited by two CID agents at his home. He talked to them for a couple hours, and he gave it to them because he wanted. He figured it. You know, he's being open about this and sincere in his own beliefs. Well, Mr. Thompson had his own trial here at the same courtroom a few months ago, and uh, same judge and everything. And from my understanding, if I'm not mistaken, that evidence for this trial, there was some maneuverings going on. The government didn't want that entered into this trial, but um, as we can see, the defense attorneys prevailed and it was entered into evidence. The reason you saw the tape entered on the very first day, early in the trial, by the prosecution was one of strategy. When you, um, when you uh, have something that's bad against your position, then it looks better in the eyes of the jury is the theory that to, to you be the one to present it. So that's that's what I know about that.